uh, your uh, problems that you face uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, we would recognize key contributions from our frontline heroes. Now, for the first of in this series, uh, I have uh, a proud privilege to present uh, a dear friend, one of the doyens of the industry, uh, a very uh, fine doctor, a fine management expert, a fine human being, Dr. H. Sudarshan Balal, who's the chairman of the Manipal Hospitals Organization and is also past president of Nat Health, the Healthcare Federation of India. A word about him, he was the best outgoing student, Blue Ribbon Awardee of the Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and a recipient of many gold medals in MBBS and MD. Later, he had his further training in the US and had, has the distinction of being one of the few to be triple board certified in internal medicine, nephrology, and critical care. And you know, internal medicine and critical care are playing a huge role in this pandemic. He's recently nominated as member in the board of management in Manipal Academy of Higher Education. And he's the first one to set up a training program in nephrology in the state of Karnataka and as way back as 1999 and trains the largest number of nephrology postgraduates in Karnataka. His list of uh, awards and recognitions is huge, uh, but I'll just name a few. The uh, Raj, uh, Raj Yog Swasa Award 2005, Arya Bhatta International Award 2010, Dr. B.C. Roy Award 2010, Namma Bengaluru Award, 2010, and many, many more. He has, of course, numerous uh, publications in national and international journals. And Dr. Bilal has been actively involved in many corporate social responsibilities through his family trust named Messrs. Belange Sanjeeva Hegde Trust. Over to you, Dr. Bilal, uh, for this uh, first in a long series, I hope, and we could have found no one better than you to start this. Dr. Balal. At please. the outset, thank you very much, Dr. Mahajan. You indeed are a dear friend for the very generous introduction. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahajan, the current president of Nat Health, the Secretary General Siddhartha and the team of Nat Health for organizing this very, very important interaction. It's truly an interaction between our frontline warriors and the people who are sitting in their offices like us. And we need to know what is it that you're going through? How is it that we can work together to make your life more comfortable? The tsunami of Corona was totally unexpected. And unfortunately, we were not very prepared for it. The sheer numbers, the ferocity and the rapidity of the spread took the world and us by storm and has let us literally gasping for breath. And but for all of you, we would have been in dire straits. And before I start anything, from the bottom of my heart, a big, big thank you to the great Corona warriors who have saved the country for us. With these few words of introduction, I would like to talk about what is happening in the healthcare industry in this uh, second tsunami of Corona. Obviously, it took us by storm. The numbers went up exponentially from something like 10,000 cases a day to about 400,000 cases per day in a matter of few weeks. And deaths also rose to about 4,000 uh, deaths per day. And the huge need and the surge for beds, oxygen, ICU, medications overwhelmed the system rapidly because no one had expected this kind of a rapid surge in these kind of numbers. However, I think we still have hope because many countries which have gone through this, like uh, many countries in Europe, England, and America, went through similar surges. And in fact, if you look at the statistics, their stats were worse than ours, but now have come out of it. And uh, America and some parts of uh, Europe have now let their masks down, literally, 
and have uh, allowed people to walk around without a mask. And of course, uh, they do recommend social distancing, masking in special situations. But for the common man, I think they're almost back to the freedom we had almost 18 months ago. Hopefully, we together will fight this out and uh, conquer Corona, but should not let our guard down, which is a mistake we made the first time. And hopefully, we don't repeat the mistakes and also be fully prepared for the third wave far better than what we were for the second wave. So since this is an interactive session, I won't say very much. I would rather ask, uh, have you ask the questions and answer whatever I could. With this, I open it for discussion. Siddhartha, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Balal. Thank you, Dr. Mahajan, indeed. Uh, we had reached out uh, to uh, uh, the frontline uh, workers uh, with a question here. Sir, in terms of, uh, I'm just going to summarize some themes first, and then we'll go to some specific questions if you would allow. Uh, the first uh, you know, broad set of questionnaires really comes around uh, the, the coronavirus, especially the working in intensive care units, every case uh, is uh, unpredictable. And there is always a pressure and uh, the pressure over a protracted period turns into fatigue. Uh, as a doctor, uh, you know, uh, uh, from your experience, Dr. Balal, what would be, how would you uh, advise the frontline workers cope with uh, the current stress and the fatigue that is building up since last year? What are some of the some practical advices that you have in mind for them, please? Thank you. No, I think uh, you have chosen uh, the right question, Mr. Siddhartha. Over the last 50 years of my practice of medicine, I have never seen anything like this as stressful to the frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, so on and so forth. It is really stressful. It's not just physical stress. Many people have been working 24 bar seven for weeks together now just to cope with the sheer volumes of sick patients that get in through the ER, to the HDUs, to the ICUs, so on and so forth. It's also mental stress. You see so many patients becoming sick and unfortunately some of them dying. One of the stress which I think many people had not seen during the previous uh, uh, effect of Corona is that now we have this helplessness. I get hundreds of calls every day saying my mother is sick, my aunt is sick, I am sick. They need an ICU bed urgently, otherwise they will die. And unfortunately, they do die because we are not able to provide them oxygenated beds. We are not able to provide them ICU beds. And that has been the hardest thing for me. People waiting in ambulances, people waiting at home, people waiting in the ER, intubated, but nowhere to go. And some of them die at home. Some of them die in the ambulance. And some of them actually come to the ER and then are sent home because there's no bed anywhere. This is the hardest part for me because you are allowing a person to die in your doorstep very well knowing that if you had the means, you could save that life. This is almost like you're acting God, saying you live, you don't. And that has been the most difficult part for me. And I'm sure the frontline workers would face it a lot more. But uh, a person who's been receiving numerous, numerous calls every day, I think that's been a very hard part than the actual physical and mental trauma of taking care of sick patients. So obviously this drains you physically and mentally. And I've seen some of the most aggressive, very vivacious, active, proactive intensivists actually go into depression. So we do a lot of counseling for them. And we also talk about the good news, saying that this is a temporary phase. This too shall pass. And we have seen that happen. And I'm being honest when I say this too shall pass. I made a prediction about two or three weeks ago. By 15th to 20th of May, we'll see a significant downward trend in Bangalore. And from a peak of 25,000, we have come to about uh, 8,000 now, almost a 60% drop in the uh, numbers. And I'm hopeful that this will continue. But believe me, this will depend, uh, depend mostly on human behavior, not on the medications, not on vaccines alone, but human behavior. If we are careful, we can drive Corona away or at least keep it at bay. So I think uh, that is one part of the good news that this is a temporary phenomenon and we'll get over it with the right human behavior, right vaccination, so on and so forth. The second thing which uh, is vastly different from last time is when this disease first came, we didn't know anything about the disease. It was absolutely a new virus, new disease. We didn't know what it causes, how it spreads, so on and so forth. 
And unfortunately, a huge number of the medical, paramedical and nursing fraternity and the healthcare workers in general succumb to the illness. I've known some friends, uh, nephrologists, uh, both in Bangalore and outside of Bangalore, actually die of severe lung failure waiting for a lung transplant. So that was the tragedy last time. In our own uh, hospital with over 7,000 or 8,000 workers, we had about uh, 70 to 18 percent of our workers actually getting infected. Uh, a fairly large number got infected, and that is true of many other uh, uh, large chains that I'm aware of. Fortunately, we didn't lose anyone, and we, of course, took care of all the people who got infected, and uh, thankfully, all of them walked home. However, what is vastly different this time is out of this uh, 7,000 or 8,000 uh, people we have, not more than a handful, less than a dozen have been infected this time. So this speaks volumes of our measures to prevent the infection, at least in healthcare workers. I think two things we have learned. One is personal protection. I think that was not being followed nor known very well during the first time. And now I think everyone is very, very clear that if you have to deal with COVID, take it that everyone that you see has COVID. Like the universal protection which started uh, uh, with the AIDS or HIV where you said any person, their uh, blood is probably infected, so you have to take universal precautions. So also now we recommend that you take universal precautions of anyone you see. Uh, take it for granted that person might have COVID. So I think a lot of personal protection, uh, maybe different grades, like, like an N95 mask, goggles, visors, and a full PPE for people who are in the forefront, like ICUs, anesthesia, ER, so on and so forth. That is one aspect. The second aspect is fortunately for us, we did get the vaccination quite early. Uh, we started our vaccination program uh, in January of uh, this year, and uh, we were successful in uh, vaccinating more than 90% of healthcare workers. So I do believe this combination of uh, personal protection, precautions, plus vaccination has prevented a large number of people from getting infected, and also less people infected, less morbidity and less mortality. That is certainly the silver lining, the cloud of corona. So one is we know the disease better, we have taken better protection. We are uh, we have less number of people infected. But the downside is the numbers of people that we are taking care of now is huge. And like what we did last time, we have recommended a shift system so that no one person or one team is totally burdened. They get some at least some time off, maybe three days, six days, seven days, where they can have time for themselves, for their family, relax, have a normal sleep pattern, normal uh, food habits which also will go a long way in maintaining their mental balance. I think all these put together where uh, we take enough precautions, vaccinate people, follow the universal precautions, give them time off during this busy schedule and constant counseling has helped us in keeping the physical and mental health of our healthcare workers. But in spite of that, I must congratulate the frontline workers and not only the frontline workers, but also their families for putting up with this because everyone is not only concerned about himself or herself, but also what happens to my child, my wife, my family, my parents at home when I go back, am I going to carry the virus? So these are some of the issues that will constantly nag you and hopefully with the kind of measures we have taken, we'll have some solution in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Balal. Um... I think you have already, uh, so you answered uh, really the question in terms of uh, the stress and the fatigue levels. Uh, in terms of uh, protecting the, the healthcare workers and their family, also you've answered a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the your suggestions are very well taken. So do you foresee a need for additional vaccination? Some questions have come in. Uh, as the virus mutates, is there a need for, uh, you know, continuous vaccinations? Are there certain drugs, therapeutics that will, uh, that will preventively fortify uh, any sort of infection among frontline workers? What are some of your thoughts and opinions around that? Thank you. Well, I think our opinions have changed with times. A lot of uh, hype for uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, human boosters, so on and so forth. But this has not uh, been proven by science, and I don't think there's any real role now for any prophylaxis other than the precautions that is COVID-appropriate behavior, masking, distancing, and washing, avoiding crowds, and of course now vaccination. I don't think there's anything else that can prevent the disease. The two forms of vaccination: is one is under your control, masking, distancing, hand washing. The other one is the vaccines that are currently available. Other than these, I don't think 
uh, I mean, uh, I guess there's no harm in taking some vitamins and things like that. But I don't think we should take it as uh, preventive measures for COVID. The only prevention is avoiding the virus and also uh, boosting your immune system by the vaccination. And uh, I do believe uh, that uh, we will get over this virus. It's just a matter of time. But the problem is we don't learn from our mistakes. I think uh, the negligence of our citizens and also uh, people who were uh, running the system led to this disaster. If we were more careful, didn't pat ourselves on the back and say we have conquered COVID, we had the least mortality, least morbidity, we would have been better prepared for the second because everywhere in the world and everywhere in history, right from 1914, we knew that viral pandemics just don't vanish. They keep coming back in cycles and we are smarter than the virus, hopefully, and we can manage these cycles better if we are prepared to address these cycles. Unfortunately, we let our guard down. Uh, we didn't wrap up our healthcare system. We didn't uh, implement COVID-appropriate behavior. And of course, we started vaccination with the right earners, but we didn't follow it through. I think uh, our uh, vaccination after the first and second phases of uh, healthcare workers and frontline faltered. We opened up vaccine for different categories, but didn't have production lines, uh, supply chain. So I think the vaccination drive is now faltering. But fortunately for us, the government has uh, come up with many different means of either procuring, ramping up production and uh, importing vaccines. And hopefully we'll, back, we'll be back on track in the next month or so. But I think it is important that we keep one step ahead of the virus. Otherwise, the virus will overtake you and you'll lose the race. And that is my important message. Even after we control the second cycle, please be prepared for the third wave and take measures to blunt the third wave right now. So no role for any prevention other than COVID appropriate behavior and vaccination. All the rest have not stood the test of uh, scientific scrutiny. There's no harm in taking some vitamins, D, C, zinc, so on and so forth. But I don't think you can take it as uh, a protective measure for the COVID virus. The only protection is the preventive measures you take and the vaccination. And please, please do not let your guard down with or without the vaccination. Dr. Balal, the next, uh, thank you, sir. The next question is really around uh, where is this virus uh, headed? I know we talk a lot about wave two waning down, uh, wave three uh, around the corner. Uh, as the virus changes its shape and direction, what will be the, uh, you know, the, 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 how will the wave three really look like? The other question is also around uh, really uh, how do we take care of uh, you know, the non-COVID patients at a time when COVID is, uh, you know, really ramping up. There is uh, the, the entire non-COVID load has not gone away. And what is the best way to manage uh, the needs of both the COVID and the non-COVID segments? Over no, these are some very important uh, questions and also something very close to my heart. I'll address the first part of the question, which is, will the virus mutate and will we need booster doses? I think history has taught us that the virus is mutate not only the COVID-19, but every other virus mutates when it replicates for various reasons. And we have also found that most vaccinations, you need a booster dose. And we have seen that with the, uh, with the common example being influenza. We take a booster dose every year. And uh, based on the fact that the virus mutates, every year it's a new vaccine. So I would not be surprised if we have to take a corona vaccine every year, every eight months or whatever, and it is a given that we'll have to take the vaccinations uh, repeatedly. How often is something that uh, the medical experts are yet to decide. Most people believe the immunity may last about eight months, 12 months. So I'm fairly certain that we'll have a vaccination at least once a year. And obviously based on the number of mutations and how the mutations behave, there may be a change in the way the vaccine is uh, manufactured and delivered, like what happens in the flu vaccine. So these two are a given that the viruses will uh, mutate the vaccination will be, have to be repeated. And whether the same vaccine or whether it is a vaccine that's modified for the mutation is something that time will decide. So I think, don't think there's any question on that. But my biggest concern, both during the last uh, wave of corona and the current tsunami of corona, was that what do we do with non-COVID patients? And this is a tragedy of sorts. I really, really feel sad for the patients with non-COVID illness because COVID has taken stented stage there is nowhere to go for patients with non-COVID, whether it's cancer, kidney disease, heart attacks, diabetes, hypertension, uh, lung disease, so on and so forth. 
I have actually physically seen a lot of patients move from stage two of cancer to stage four of cancer. People with CKD going on to end stage renal disease dying because they cannot go for dialysis. Many dialysis centers are closed and uh, they are unable to travel because of the lockdown. This is an unbelievable tragedy, but no one talks about it very much because Corona has taken center stage. We have to take care of every life. Corona life and a non-corona life to me is the same. Any person dying because of lack of medical care is the same, whether it is because of corona or non-corona. And this is something that the healthcare experts, both in the private sector, public sector, and the government should take notice of when we, fa uh, when we sort of plan the future of the health of this country. Unfortunately, health had uh, taken a back seat for almost 70 years after our independence. It's only after the corona pandemic that uh, health sector has been given some importance that it richly deserved. And hopefully the planners of the country and also the healthcare givers of the country will in the future plan for both pandemic care and non-pandemic uh, or uh, non-COVID kind of care for the future hospitals. Because we cannot sort of say, we'll only take a corona, non-corona, please get out of the hospital. So this is not on, and this is the tragedy of corona. You have killed due to corona and have also killed a lot of people because non-corona care almost is non-existent in the country now. Thank you, sir. I think the implication of what you just mentioned is the wave three and the wave four may not only be a corona wave, it could be a corona and a non-corona wave that is building up as we speak. Um, I think the next uh, question is really around skilling and uh, capacity building. Uh, as the So there are two questions here which are tied uh, to each other. One is from a frontline manager whose question is, uh, what sort of additional, uh, what's the way I motivate my team who is uh, you know, providing these uh, very critical services? Uh, what sort of, uh, what are the tools, techniques and the training uh, that you know, I need to undertake? And the second question is, uh, the disease is now spreading from uh, really the urban and the peri-urban into more rural parts of the countries where you don't have the same uh, level and the density of uh, you know, infrastructure or uh, skills uh, that are required to deal with it. What are some of the transferable practices and the trainings that can be done and to rapidly adopt to the evolving scenario? Uh, uh, oh, sure. So many of the things that you have mentioned is something that has to be a long-term issue. Uh, we cannot ramp up any healthcare system going from 1,000 beds to 10,000 beds in a matter of weeks. Even if we go from 1,000 beds to 10,000 beds, manning these hospitals and the required personnel is almost impossible. So this has to be a long-term planning. Unfortunately, what happens is we forget uh, as soon as we the disease goes away, we forget that this can happen again. We should have uh, a, a continuous process of ramping the healthcare system not only for this pandemic, but also for future pandemic. And also the tsunami of uh, non-communicable diseases. India had more non-communicable disease deaths uh, than com communicable diseases till uh, Corona hit the scene. So we cannot ignore that. So I think we have to ramp up our healthcare system. And unfortunately, most of the healthcare system, I would say 80 to 90% of the healthcare system is in the metros and the cities and the very, very little healthcare is available in the semi-urban and rural areas. And those are the areas that need to be strengthened. Now, as an emergency measure, we need some people now, we need some beds now. What we can do is we can sort of dip into our reserves, uh, which is people who have finished their MBBS are waiting to take their uh, entrance exams or waiting to go abroad or uh, just leaving for the NEET. Those can be sort of taken in with some incentives, both for their future and for the current uh, work that they're doing and ask them to be employed in the COVID care centers or in the COVID care hospitals under supervision. So also we can take a large number of nursing students, the huge number of nursing colleges, people who have graduated or finally are graduates. And even from the teaching cadres like MSc nursing, you can use them. So also there are a large number of foreign medical graduates waiting to get an equivalent degree in India. And obviously with some uh, quick training, they can be used at least under in a supervised manner and at least for teleconsults during this crisis. And many people other than the medical pulmonology intensive care and emergency care should be roped in for the care of COVID patients during this uh, crisis times, maybe from anesthesia. People who have any intensive care background, be it surgical, obstetric, or any other fields, orthopedics. I've had a lot of orthopedic surgeons 
volunteer to work in the COVID uh, ER or e uh, ICUs. So anyone who has taken care of sick patients, irrespective of which field they're in, should be roped in as an emergency to take care of these patients. We should also look at uh, people who have recently retired. Unfortunately, retirement age in India is very, very young still, uh, current, uh, sort of 58, 60, which is very young in the current context. They should be roped in. And certainly we should uh, use uh, people from the armed forces uh, as a temporary measure to help us out during this crisis. But skilling and the increasing the number of professionals has to be a long-term plan. What we can do is emergency measures to tide over the crisis based on what we have uh, told you. And this has been done in the US, uh, UK, and other places. They have taken interns, they have taken uh, people who are not in the field of medicine to rope in and help them out with the COVID care. We, so we can do the same. So it's not something new we are doing. And uh, certainly look at the future uh, to uh, meet our needs. We need to increase the number of training centers, number of training facilities. But the biggest challenge for us is not the number of doctors alone, but the inequitable distribution of doctors. Take it whereas it is cities versus rural. There's no dearth of doctors. In fact, other, before Corona came in, one of uh, my colleague uh, called me and said, Dr. Balal, you're doing disservice to us by training so many nephrologists. There are too many nephrologists in the city. We have no work. So everyone is in the city, no one goes to the periphery. And we have similar inequitable distribution. Let's say Karnataka has enough number of doctors, nurses, but you go to some of the other states like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, you hardly have any medical colleges and doctors. So there is not just a matter of numbers, it's inequitable distribution too that needs to be addressed. So these are something that the planners should start looking now. Now, obviously they, uh, they have taken healthcare as a prime uh, subject. It was given a lot of importance in the current budget. Hopefully this trend will continue and we won't be lulled, lulled by complacency after this pandemic uh, weathers down or uh, withers down. Dr. Balal, uh, one, uh, I think the last but one question, uh, and it's a very important one. Um, with the current situation where uh, there is a scarcity of beds, oxygen, any sort of medicines, uh, any uh, medical supplies, um, how do the uh, frontline workers manage this, uh, uh, the, the expectations uh, of often very angry uh, patients, patient relatives? Uh, it's a system that uh, you know, has the scarcity. However, it's often the, the brunt of it is faced by the doctors and the frontline workers. Uh, and, and what in your opinion is a better, slightly longer term way of dealing with this situation we have already seen some very unfortunate incidents being played out in different parts, incidents that involve borderline violence, violence that has taken place against medical professionals. We'd like to hear your thoughts and advice on that, please. Yeah. Thank and there's one part of the previous question that I probably left unanswered is how do we sort of bridge the rural urban divide? And uh, to me, uh, digital health is one mode of doing that. <laughs> and we have seen that in the past, digital health, uh, whether it is teleconsultation, EICU, so on and so forth, has really sort of bridged the divide, not entirely replaced rural health care, but has helped it. To give you one example, the government of Karnataka, along with uh, uh, Manipal and Colombia Asia, which is, of course, now our family too, uh, started a program where our intensivist respiratory physicians and uh, emergency room doctors uh, had an e-consult, uh, teleconsult, and an EICU with each district headquarter hospital of Karnataka. So nothing changed. The personnel were the same. The infrastructure was somewhat similar. They just sort of discussed, and we have done tens of thousands of consults over the last uh, many months. And what there was a dramatic change in the mortality. The mortality decreased by 50% after we started this concept of uh, e-consults between our uh, headquarters in Bangalore, and uh, district headquarters of hospitals in the rural areas. So I think it made a huge difference. Uh, similar things, I don't think we should forget uh, digital health once uh, uh, the pandemic is better. I think we should use that because that will solve some of the divide between the rural and urban areas, though not a complete one. We should also look at uh, uh, having nurse practitioner, physician assistants uh, manning some primary health care centers because it'd be impossible to get a doctor and even if you get a doctor, it will be difficult to, for them to be posted in primary health care centers because it's just not uh, the primary health care center alone. It's also the, what the environment, connectivity, uh, sort of uh, 
what is the life you have there so i don't think overnight we can send doctors and dump them into the primary health centers so we should have a plan of running these with uh, nurse practitioners physician assistants which is done in the us too i mean most of the primary care is now done by nurse practitioners and physician assistants under the supervision of a doctor so i think it is doable and uh, some of the nurses are trained who are extremely good they can manage the situation quite well and uh, obviously with e consults and physical movement to a bigger center if it's uh, necessary and the second question is the question of violence against doctors which gets exaggerated in a pandemic situation because there are a lot of sick people you cannot attend to all of them and sometimes unfortunately uh, because of no fault of yours maybe lack of uh, infrastructure lack of oxygen lack of medicines lack of space patients might die and the relatives get irate and actually they might indulge in physical violence which we have seen not uh, to a large extent uh, in this part of the country at least where i live but i have read a lot of reports here i think uh, two or three things are necessary one is the government should come down heavily on violence against healthcare workers and uh, healthcare facilities they should go to jail uh, irrespective of what happens they should be arrested this is a cognizable offense and there are laws to say that if you assault a doctor nurse or the healthcare facility you go to jail and that has to be implemented with full vigor but it's not totally a law and order problem we need to create awareness and one of the biggest problems we have seen during this pandemic is that the triaging system has failed what happens is when the patients run from hospital to hospital and they can see their relative deteriorating during this movement from hospital to hospital gasping for breath and then finally stopping breathing they are angry uh, at the world and whichever hospital they land in they'll be angry that the hospital was not able to take care of them but the hospital hands are tied where do you take a patient when there are already 10 people in the er corridor who are intubated where do you take this person so i think an effective triad system where the patients don't run but the triaging uh, person or the triad center tells you which hospital to go which icu to go and then the patients won't get so angry if you say you go to this hospital and the bed there they won't get angry they are angry when they bring a sick patient and the hospital turns them away or they die in the ambulance or they have to go from hospital to hospital so some of this can be managed of course the oxygen system was quite critical and i don't blame anyone for that there was a 10 time increase in the oxygen consumption of this country in a matter of weeks no country can be prepared for this and the government has effectively now diverted all industrial oxygen of course there were some initial problems on the logistics of transportation of the oxygen from production units to the rural and uh, remote areas of india but i think that has been pretty much taken care of now you don't see so much of oxygen shortage and also the numbers are coming down because of the measures taken in the lockdown so some of these things i think for the future need better planning and uh, as far as uh, assault and healthcare workers i think more awareness of the patients better triaging system and a strict implementation of the law and order uh, situation by the government and the police is the uh, only remedy and also the healthcare workers for this critical work they are doing should have some special allowance and special insurance that is guaranteed for them either for uh, succumbing to the illness or are uh, being admitted and treated for the illness or for against any physical violence you are muted i think sorry sorry i was i don't mute uh, this question has uh, come in from uh, one of the live listeners a uh, very poignant question how do we deal with the guilt feeling for not being able to help some of our patients uh you know i think uh, this is what i mentioned early i feel guilty every day uh, hundreds of calls coming with the patients i know are going to die if we don't get care and unfortunately we are not uh, not uh, able to accommodate them and that is certainly a guilt feeling and a depressive feeling for me and unfortunately we have to adapt to circumstances we can only do our best but we cannot cure all the ailments of the world or this country overnight so we'll do our best that is the satisfaction i have if there is a bed i will not deny it to someone who is sick if there is a bed i can make by moving someone else who is not very sick i'll make that but if there are absolutely no beds uh, making a bed means killing someone else then obviously it's beyond my control so i think we'll have to wait for the pandemic to come down and i think here's where the counseling helps counseling talking to each other having groups and also i think it is important to sort of get off of your work for a short period of time continuous 24 bar 7 working in this kind of a stressful situation will only aggravate it your performance will come down you'll get more depressed 
you become despondent so those those are things we need to avoid one of the important things that i must mention is during the first pandemic uh, there are a lot of uh, nurses families you know we have a huge workforce predominantly of young uh, women working as nurses and their families were very concerned and obviously we would be to if you are going to send your young daughter to a far off place and then you have this ugly bad uh, pandemic uh, corona that shows up they would be concerned so we actually had teleconsultations and video conferences with the family in the presence of the nursing staff where they, where they we assured them that we'll keep them as safe as possible and we'll make sure if they fall ill we'll take care of them and our attrition rates actually came down quite a bit of course i must compliment the nurses who sort of withstood withstood the onslaught of corona but we also uh, made the families more comfortable and this is where dialogue helps i think uh, we have to be on the same page uh, meet talk express yourself and if you have some guilt feelings come out uh, with it talk to your colleagues talk to your mentors go, uh, talk to a counselor talk to the management but somehow don't keep it uh, sort of uh, inside so that it boils out and then you lose control thank you uh, dr balal i think we are almost dot on time so uh, any uh, thoughts suggestions dr balal you would have for natel the community as a whole to uh, really come together and is there something uh, you know of course a lot of ideas will come out of these uh, you know forum discussions over the coming weeks and days Uh, any uh, suggestions you would have for natel to kind of pursue this course uh, with with with, with uh, the multiple stakeholders that are in our network no i i do believe uh, natel is a significant force of planning and delivery of uh, healthcare in the country and now it's uh, led by very very able people uh, like dr mahadev as president and uh, sir the us secretary general i think what we really need to do is look at the planning for the future i think we should work with the government and we already have a large number of private health sector uh, people in that health i think we should work together in planning the healthcare for the future not only for routine things but also face the pandemics of corona or any other virus and the pandemic of uh, non communicable diseases which are uh, waiting to erupt it's like a rumbling volcano so we have to plan for the future and this should start should not be very siloed i think it should be right from primary health care in the rural areas to secondary care tertiary care quaternary care i think this is uh, something that we have to plan it cannot be done by one man one person and i think certainly there is enough brain power in nat health to uh, help the government in this planning and i'm sure uh, uh, nat health speaks certainly they would listen because what we would say is with scientific backing so i think nat health has a huge role to plan for the future of healthcare of the country and also would have a huge uh, uh, role in pushing digital health and uh, also skilling because we need skilled people to run our healthcare system so planning digital health skilling are the three things that i can uh, uh, think of from the top of my mind but there are many other things that uh, natel is already doing and will continue to do i wish natel uh, all the very best and uh, you guys are doing a great job and i'm sure you'll continue to do, uh, do this thank you dr balal a lot uh, dr mahajan i would like to hand it over to you sir for your closing remarks thank you uh, thank you very much uh, siddharth and thank you dr balal for uh, you. you know really deep insights um, as as a soldier on the front and uh, also you know we've had a very very good response from audience that has uh, uh, joined in and uh, frankly from uh, nat health i can say that we will be always there uh, uh, to uh, you know do whatever we can in our own uh, limited way uh, to help uh, especially the frontline workers overcome all the problems that they are facing both uh, physical mental familial all of these and uh, i'm sure that uh, what we discuss today and what we are going to discuss in the future will become a repository which we can uh, uh, delve into uh, uh, any time uh, we need uh, wise counsel and wisdom and come up with solutions for problems that we are facing 
so thank you very very much uh, dr balal uh, for being the opening batsman if i may use that term uh, in our quest uh, uh, to learn from uh, frontline workers and to help in whatever way that we can uh, over to you uh, sadat so thank you both uh, dr mahajan dr balal uh, uh, it's been a very very insightful uh, you know uh, introductory session to this uh, uh, to this series that we are creating um, tomorrow we will be uh, having the privilege of uh, having dr arvin lal from 11:30 am who will be our next speaker so uh, for those of you who are listening uh, i would request you to please uh, send your questions uh we will prepare uh, for tomorrow sessions each of these uh, uh, sessions will be transcribed the key questions will be put out in a blog format and hopefully that's uh, going to be useful for many many uh, frontline workers who could not join today and we'll find a way to kind of get it across to all the frontline workers over time uh in partnership uh, you know with not only through natel but also in partnership with all our federations uh, with whom we closely work with Uh, again thank you for taking the time today and we hope to see you soon tomorrow uh, and uh, look forward to continue this dialogue ahead thank you again bye bye thank you dr majan thank you siddhartha for thank having you. me here thank you very and much. thank you to thank a wonderful you. audience thank you